Hello and welcome to Slurm Submission Script Basics. First, let's take a quick overview of the HPCC system layout. When you first log in, you're on the gateway node. At this point, you have no access to the software that's installed in the cluster, nor the scratch file system, and you're not able to submit a batch job. This is the front door and is not meant for doing work. When you SSH to the development node, you're able to access over 800 compute nodes to run your work by using the scheduler. One way to execute your work on these compute nodes is by writing a batch script. In this video, we'll walk through how to prepare a script to be used to request resources that your job needs. Each programming workflow has unique requirements, so before you sit down to write your script, it's important that you determine the sequence of steps required to run your job and the resources you'll need. Things like the wall time that you'll require, the memory that the program will need to run, and of course, the number of cores and nodes that you will need. A few tips for determining your needs. All programs require a certain amount of memory to function properly. To see how much memory your program needs, you can check the documentation or you can run an interactive session using the top command and profile your job. To determine the amount of time your job should run for, which is the wall time, you want to test the subset of data and extrapolate from that point. Whether your program can accommodate the use of GPUs is going to be stated in the program documentation. And of course, you'll need to know how many instances of the program you want to run and how many cores that each task or instance will require. And this will help you to determine whether you are submitting multiple or single tasks and whether your tasks are independent or parallel. So what goes into a batch script? The job script is divided into two main parts. The first part contains Slurm commands to the scheduler requesting resources such as the number of nodes, cores per node, tasks across nodes, what account you might be using, how long you'll be running your job for. The second part of the script contains commands that indicate how your job should be run. Common pieces of information to include here are environment variables. So you want to set up the environment so you can run your job. This can include loading modules, setting up additional path variables so that you can run a specific program that you wrote yourself. And some programs will also require a scratch directory to run from. Programs with heavy I.O. load may have lots of reads and writes, and then you want to copy your data first to scratch directory because your home directory is not able to handle high I.O. load. Once you've set up your environment and copied your data, you're now ready to launch your job. So if you use the scratch directory to run your job, then you want to copy your output files from scratch back to your home directory um, because the Scratch file system is not backed up. Finally, you want to remove any temporary files you created or any Scratch data that you no longer need, and you want to capture the job details for troubleshooting later on. This can help you in the future if you want to adjust your resource requests. So let's take a few minutes now and actually run a job. The files needed to follow along with me in this example are provided below. You can simply download the R tutorial directory to your home directory on HPCC. To do this, simply download the R tutorial directory to your home directory on the HPCC. The command to do this is wget followed by the URL. This directory contains some R code and the Slurm submission script, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. Additionally, to work along with me on this example, you'll need to install the R package Facto Extra in your home directory, since it's not currently available on the HPCC. The script add underscore rlib.sh automatically does this for you. You'll need to run the script before you try this example. Once you've run the script once, you won't need to do that again. I won't describe the script in this video, but a few comments are added to the script for you to follow along. If you want more details on how to install our libraries on the HPCC, visit the web link in the comments below. So 
Here we are, we're on the HPCC, and um, I am going to CD to the R tutorial directory. Um, and here we can see that I have the K means analysis script, the SVAD script, and some data, which in this example I don't use. To write a JavaScript, you'll need to use an editor. This can be either Notepad on your local laptop or on the HPCC, you have access to VI, Emacs, and Nano. In this example, I'll use Nano to look at a JavaScript that I've already prepared. So let's take a look at this JavaScript. So right at the very top, the script first begins with the hash sign, then pound sign followed by bin bash. This indicates to the scheduler the interpreter, which will be used for the commands that follow. Without this, the scheduler won't know how to interpret any of what follows. So it's really important to have this line at the very beginning of your JavaScript. Next, you want to specify the resources that your job will need. This needs to come before you specify your job's workflow. Notice that each of these lines again begins with a hash sign followed by s bash. These are not comments. This pound followed by s bash indicates that there are directives to the scheduler. So let's go over a few of the directives that we have in the script. First, I begin by giving my job a name so I can recognize it when I see it in the queue. And then because my job only runs on a single node and I have a single task, um, and I'm only using one CPU, I will specify my resource request as using end tasks to indicate I only have one task and that that task only use, uses one CPU. Moreover, I'll indicate that I need 250 megabytes of memory and my job will then run for 10 minutes. Lastly, Slurm combines both the error and output files into one output file and I'm specifying the name uh, here for that output file. Percent %x indicates the job name and percent %j indicates the job number. So right now we don't know what that is, but when it does get assigned, that number will be concatenated here to the name of the output. Next, we want to provide our workflow using some command lines. In this section, wherever I do use a hash sign, that is a comment. Okay, so first I set up a few convenience variables. I set up the variable name because I don't want to keep writing the name of this script. Um, and then I set up my environment in which my job will run. I first remove all modules that are currently loaded using module purge. And then I load only the modules that I'm interested in. The reason for doing module purge first is so that Slurm does not carry over any variables when my job begins to run and I know what the environment looks like when my job is executed. Lastly, I export the variable rlibs, which points to that library we just downloaded in our home directory. Next, if you need to copy files to scratch, you can create a directory, you can create a directory and do that here. Then we run our analysis here. Notice I'm using the dash dash vanilla flag. That's because I don't want R to read the .R environment or .R profile configuration files when R starts up. I just want to use a clean R environment. Note this does not negate the fact that I am pointing to a library in my home directory. So I call R script followed by the name of my program and then I'm redirecting the output from that program into the, the file name here, which has the name dollar name, followed by my job ID. A couple of things to note here. This is not required. If I don't specify a file here, then the output just gets dumped into the other Slurm output. But sometimes you want the output file to be separate, and I do in this case. Finally, notice that I'm attaching the job name here. This just helps me that if I have to troubleshoot my output that I can very quickly retrieve the job ID and get some help with that job. Finally, if I did copy data to scratch, I would then need to copy those files back to my home directory 
and remove any temporary files that were created. Lastly, I want to write some information about the job to the Slurm output file. How I ran the job is what S control show job will provide for me, and then my, what my resource usage was. A note about the command JS here, this is a command that will only work on the HPCC. It's a power tool command, and so in order to use it, I loaded this module power tools. So to submit the job, I'm going to do sbatch submit. And there I get a job number. And to see the current status of my job, I'm going to do sq-u followed by my user ID. And there I can see my job k-means.test. It's pending and um, the resources I have requested. So once my job gets eligible to run, this state here will change from pending to running. And so now I can see that my job's running. I can see the name of the node it's running on, how many nodes it's actually running on. So if I try this command again, I, can, I don't have anything in the queue. And so my job's most likely done running. So if I look at my home directory or my current directory, I can see that now I have this output file with output from my job, and then I have this slurm output file here. Let's just take a look at what that what's contained there. So here I can see the resources that I requested. I can see where I submitted my job from, what my working directory was, and where my standard output and error files are. Below is the output from the PowerTool JS. So let's take a look. And the first column shows the resources I requested, and the second column shows what I actually utilized. So here you can see that I requested one CPU, and I used one CPU. I requested a total of 250 megs of RAM, and I actually used something like three megs of RAM. So here you can see I requested 10 minutes of wall time, but I actually only utilized a couple seconds. Of that time, you can see that only five seconds was CPU time. Typically, these two, the elapsed and the total CPU time, tend to be similar because we are only requesting one node. But in a situation where, where we are requesting a multi-node job, you would expect that the total CPU time would be greater than the elapsed time. So for example, if your program requested two cores and you used a wall time of one hour, you might expect about two hours of total CPU time to have elapsed. If you're noticing that your job doesn't run any faster when you add cores or processors, it means you're not getting significant speed ups with increasing process counts. So the resources are being wasted and something is wrong either with how your program's written or how you're allocating resources. Now take a look at the output file. There's my output data. It looks fine. Um, it's what I'm expecting. Also, in my, this program produces a few images. I can take a look at these with XPDF, or I can move them back to my local laptop and take a look at them. So let's just look at final cluster PDF. Oh, no, I didn't log in with dash X, so I'm not able to see this. So I'm just going to move this back to my home directory here to take a look. Um, so here we go. So I'm going to open a new tab. So here I am. I'm on my desktop. I'm going to go to my downloads folder. And we're going to transfer this image back to our local computer. So first I provide my username at rsync.hpcc.msu.edu colon followed by the path to uh, our image. And I'm going to use the same file name, final file cluster. It appears I have an error here. Let's try this again. Um, not really sure what happened there. 
There we go. It appears this time the transfer worked. So let's take a look. Here I am. Again, we're going to downloads. And here's the final cluster file. And I can view that output of the final cluster. It's pretty neat. Below are a few of the commonly used etch batch directives. First, notice that the pound sign in front of etch batch is not a comment and it's not optional. This indicates that this is a directive to the scheduler. So each job script will look different, but every job script should have the time indicated for, for how long that job will run and is provided in the format of days, hours, minutes, and seconds. There is a job limit of 168 hours or seven days, so your job can run as long as 168 hours. You can indicate the memory per node you require using the dash dash mem option. The unit you provide at the end indicates whether you're talking about megabytes or gigabytes or terabytes. So sometimes you may want to indicate multiple nodes, and a dash dash nodes flag is what you would use to do that. But you'll most likely always need to indicate how many tasks you plan to run, how many instances of your program you plan to run, and a dash dash n tasks flag is what you'll use to indicate that. For each task, you may want to indicate how many CPUs you're allocating, and the dash dash CPU per task flag is what you'd use to do that. Similarly, if you're wanting to spread your job across nodes, then the end tasks per node flag is what you'd use to indicate how many tasks you'd like to allocate to each node. So let's look at a brief example of how I would allocate 16 cores. So in all of these node combinations below, I need 16 cores, but the specifics of how these are distributed depends on what my job looks like. So for instance, if you, you're, you're using MPI and you don't care where the cores are distributed, or if you want to launch 16 independent processes with no communication, then you'll only need to specify the dash dash n tasks, n tasks flag equals 16. That is in addition to the wall time and in addition to the memory. If you want to indicate that the, you want these cores spread across distinct nodes, then you'll also need to use the dash dash nodes flag equals 16 and the end task flag equals 16. Another way to specify this exact same um, configuration would be to specify end task equals 16 and end task per node equal 1. So supposing now you would like these 16 cores to be spread across 16 nodes but you don't want any other jobs to run on those nodes. Then you'd also, in addition to the end tasks and end nodes flags, you'd specify the dash dash exclusive flag, which means you only want your jobs to run on those 16 nodes. Another configuration may be that you have 16 processes and you want those 16 processes to run across eight different nodes with two processes per nodes. Well, you'd still have, need to specify the end tasks equals 16, but then you're, you'd also specify end tasks per node equal two. Similarly, if you wanted these tasks to stay, all stay on the same node, then you'd specify end tasks per node equals 16 instead of two. Let's suppose you have one process though that's using 16 cores for multi multi-threading. The way you'd indicate that is you'd specify end tasks equal one since you only have one process, and then CPUs per task equals 16. Notice you're using here CPUs per task to specify the number of cores that you're allocating for a particular task. Last last e example here is if you had you were running four processes that each use four cores um, for multi-threading, then you'd, you had n tasks equal four for the four processes and CPUs per task equal four. And again, in all of these cases, you're only using 16 nodes, but the way in which you're running your job may be different. Hence, the flexibility in specifying your resources. So we've gone through the basics for writing your first job script. 
And in the next video, we'll take a look at some specific examples of running an MPI job, an OpenMP job, an array job. Thanks for watching. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to us at contact.acer.msu.edu. We also have open office hours from 1 to 2 on Mondays and Thursdays, so feel free to reach out to us that way as well.